title of today's message is called Show and Tell, all right? I had the great privilege. I was at uh, Springfield, Missouri uh, this week. We were um, planning some things for those of, you, those of you who are familiar with fine arts. We're planning the National Fine Arts that's going to be taking place in Columbus, Ohio in August 2020. And so we're really excited about that because it's a conference, it's fine arts, and you know, seeing students using their gifts, but then we also have a a missions trip attached to it where kids go out to the city and start serving the communities around. So we're super excited about it. But when I was in Missouri, they have a a, a state motto. Do you know what their state motto is in Missouri? It's the, it's the show me state. Like, I just love that. Like, the show me state. Like, you got to show me, all right? And and that's that's kind of how it talks to them. Like, you got to show me, all right? But I, I was like, okay, I wonder where they got this from. Where's the show me state? So it actually came... In 1899, one of the representatives, Willard D. Van Dever, all right, that's a mouthful, said, frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I, I, I feel like I'm going to say how I think he said it. He probably had like this heavy just accent. He said, I'm from Missouri. You've got to show me. I like that. And I think in our Christian life, as followers of Jesus, we can always complicate things too much. I'm, I'm a simple person by nature. I like to keep things simple. Don't we like to keep things simple? Like, just sometimes keep, not keeping things simple just stresses me out. Can I just be honest? Listen, I just, can, can I be a little therapeutic right now? Can I pour my heart out to you and you not judge me? Especially the young people. I'm at this critical age of my life. I work with young people, right, all the time. I'm at this critical, very unique place in life where technology is getting beyond me. (laughs) It's not a good feeling. When kids come and say, are you on Snapchat? I'm like, "Ah, I don't know, I don't get Snapchat. Let me show you. And they start trying to show you, and you're like overwhelmed by the information they're giving you. (laughs) TikTok, I'm like, ah, no, what What is that? I don't know. It's, It's too much, it's too much. And we live in this phase of life where technology is very prevalent, where we feel like if we have more information, that we can understand things about God better, what's happening in our world. News is around the clock. You turn it on. I mean, there's stations that are just devoted to news. It's not like back in the day where you had three channels, the news came on at six, and that was it, right? Now it's it's all, all... all day long, consuming. It's on your phone. It's on the TV. It's breaking news. This is going on. It's all these kind of things. And it reminds me, listen, of the, the situation that we even had at the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Where they eat of the fruit and, they, and, and the devil was tempting them saying, listen, if you eat of this, God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because if you do, you'll be more like him and you'll be knowing, all knowing of things. And we feel like if we could just gain more information, if we could understand things, right? The generation has grown up with, with the internet, right? I was in that phase where the internet was coming on the scene where we had dial-up, where you're, you know, you're putting your AOL free disc in and your, your dial-up's coming like, eh, and you're trying to get there. It takes you 45 minutes to log on to the internet. All that. See, this generation don't even, the younger generation don't know. They don't know the struggle. It's on your phone. Good for you. You don't know. I was at a computer the size of a house trying to get this thing to work. Now it's in your pocket. Living in blessed times, folk, blessed times. I was at, I was at camp. You know, we, we do our camps. We have our kids there. And I was saying, if you want to figure something out, where do you go? And I was expecting the answer. People were like, you know, Google, you know, Google, YouTube. I'm like, absolutely. And one person said the library. I'm like, man, bless you. Saying the library. <laughs> Parents, library, I don't know. They just said it probably like, the library. And I'm like, oh, Google? Okay, well. But there's something about keeping the gospel message of Jesus Christ simple. That God's word is everything we need for this life. It is relevant. It is current. It is for now. And we're not just here to gather information. We're here to gather revelation from God. Because we feel like, oh, if I have more information, if I have more information, the truth is if you would just live out God's word, you would find yourself further ahead than you could ever imagine. Because when you begin to say, okay, what's the world? What's going on in the economy? What's going on? God does not operate by this world's economy. God operates in the place of sowing and reaping. It says you have uh, sowed, uh, uh, reaped sparingly because you have sowed sparingly. 
God isn't up in heaven like, oh, my goodness, this price of gas. Whew. I would do things, but, man, those interest rates are high. Come on. But God is saying, in my word, if you live this thing out, listen, it's, it's not, we try to overcomplicate. Well, what, what does the Greek say about this? Live this thing out. You're, you're trying to become a theologian. You're trying to make it more difficult than reading his word and living it. Because we get good at telling things, but we don't do super what? Showing things sometimes. We could tell people, you need to come to church. You should do this. We tell our spouses, well, things will be different if you do this. We tell our kids, you should do this, you should do this. But the problem is they aren't seeing it modeled in front of them. They're looking, they're, you're being told all the time. But who's showing you? We begin to compare to other things. Look at other things. My mom and dad, I mean, they were... By the word. That's just who they were. They set the example for me. And I'm thankful for that. So listen, as we talk about show and tell, we're going to focus on the showing part, not so much on the telling part. It's funny how just sometimes in our lives, people can't hear what we're saying because our actions are speaking way too loud. So you could tell someone, I love you, but if your actions aren't matching up, your words are hollow. You could tell your spouse, I love you, but if you aren't helping out around the house, maybe. If you aren't helping with the kids. Right? Changing that poopy diaper. Not waiting until your spouse walks in the room like, I think, I think they pooped. You might want to check them out. Like, you already knew they pooped. You're like trying to time it. All right, I think she's coming in. I think he's coming in. I'll set him up. You didn't even know you are going to set up. But how are we showing God to those in our family and those in our communities, our workplace, our schools. God's word is timeless. It doesn't change. And we're going to focus in on this. Listen, you show God to others by how you love. You're like, wow, this, this, is, really, this is really deep, Nate. Wow, I'm glad you came and just told us that we show God uh, to others by how we love. Because love is hard to really live out. Because love isn't based on feelings. It isn't based upon, well, you know, uh, I feel like you're worthy or not. But love is a person. His name is Jesus. When you look at the biblical definition of love, right, it just starts out love is patient, love is kind. But I, sometimes I think I have love. Man, I got this. And then I lose my patience so quick. I get behind someone at Starbucks who doesn't know what they want. And they're taking their good old time. I'm like, this is Starbucks. Come on, hurry up. They're like, uh, mm. hey, what's in this drink? I'm like, coffee. That's what's in it. Go out the way. Uh, oh, oh, what, what's, what size is a venti? It's a large and it's a venti. Come on. And I'm like, well, I guess I lost my patience. When I'm telling my boys to do something a thousand times. And you feel like, how do I need to communicate this to you that you can understand me? <laughs> don't, don't, don't you ever, any parents, can we just have an altar time just for parents? Like, like, do I need to learn another language? Do I need to shoot you a text? Do I need to draw a picture? I don't, help me help you, right? <laughs> but sometimes God has that patience with us. When we're being disobedient, when we're not listening to his word, and we're saying, God, this is going on in my life. This is so hard. This is so difficult. You read my word? Or are you living it out? Because sometimes we want the do thing, but God's saying, you need to be faithful to the thing that I gave you. Right? Pastor Lucas was talking about, you know, we want to say, God, when I get that raise, when I get that promotion, God's saying, you're not even faithful to what I give you. The Bible says, if you're not faithful a little, how will you be faithful with much? The Bible says in Proverbs, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And so sometimes the world is saying, I, I don't know if I want to serve this Jesus because I hear you telling me things, but I'm not seeing any evidence of it in your life. I'm not seeing the way that you're showing love. That kind of love that is just crazy, out of the box, just 
unashamed love for those who are around us. Because that is the kind of love that God has given us. Our Heavenly Father, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross in the midst of our shame, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of not deserving it. God knew that we would be in this very spot dealing with the things that we'd be doing. But God said, I love you, and it's unconditional love. My love covers a multitude of sins. In his scriptures, 1 John chapter 4, it says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Don't love people that you consider easier to love, but love all people. We can't say that we love God if we're not loving people around us, and not just the people that come to Lima first, the people that you work with, your neighbor, the people that just drive you up a wall. I mean, those don't exist, but if they did. (laughs) To love those people. If we are going to show people the love of God, there has to be evidence of it. I always like to say like this. When we tell people, you know, I love you, or we're talking about the Lord, those are seeds that are sown into people's lives. But the actions is the water to them. Are we watering the seeds by the actions? Whether it's our spouse, our kids, our neighbors, we have to be in that place. Here's a quote I want to read to you. It's by Timothy Keller. It says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. Is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. This is the kind of love that God has for us, that he knows every part of our life. But he loves us so much in spite of it. That God knows exactly what's going on. And when you submit things to him, he pulls you in closer. As a family, when you begin to say, I love you, even in the midst of tough times, even in the midst where you need extra grace, I love you. And when that goes out to other areas that you're in, other circles you run in, People who don't even serve the Lord, you know, they're going to start saying, man, I don't, man, I just, they're just like so nice, right? The like, final word's like, you're just so always happy, right? Isn't that funny when you meet people like that, when you're like just loving the Lord, like, it's like, why are you so smiley? <laughs> it's, it's a good day. Oh. But love penetrates the hardest of hearts. It does. And when we get a revelation of God's love for us, it's, it should flow out of us. People should be seeing it. And we're not just telling them God loves you, but we're rude to them. Hey, God loves you, but we'll leave you a terrible tip. Come on. It's amazing. We'll reason away opportunities that God wants to use to show love for people. Let's be obedient to that. John chapter 13, verse 34, 35. I want to read this before we go to our second point. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is a powerful verse right here. Right? We know it. We hear it. If you've grown up in church, like, yeah, 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 that's, that's how people know. But this is the thing. The singular thing that God says, this is how people will know you are my disciples, by how you love each other. So, there, so it, if we're not loving each other appropriately, we're missing it. It does not say God, that people will know you are my disciples by the way you walk into church, your church attendance, how you carry your Bible. It doesn't say by how big of a check you write. That's how people know you're my disciples. It says by how you love. Because when you love something, it is sacrificial at its very nature. When I, when I was getting married, someone told me the definition of, of marriage, and they said it's two deaths and one resurrection. I was like, my goodness. But love is sacrificial. You're laying things down, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. 
Is the way we're loving people just in comfort or is it sacrificial? Are we making loving people convenient? Or are we saying, Lord, help me to love people that it's sacrificial, that it actually stretches me and grows me? How we show God's love to others is how we serve. Ooh. How do we serve? Listen, don't limit serving to tasks that need completed, but opportunities to lift someone's spirit and hands. Sometimes we can feel good about serving because we just feel like we're up for it and we could do it, right? Like guys, guys, listen, I'm just going to put ourselves on blast. Guys are the worst at this. Like husbands, like they're worse at this, right? Like they do something in the house and they feel like, Psh, yo, yo, that dishwasher is empty. I'm just saying, right? And our spouses are so loving. They're like, thank you, sweetie. That's amazing. <laughs> they be like, yeah, that's right. That's right. Husband of the year. But are we willing to serve our spouses when it's not convenient? I felt when, when you get in bed and you're all ready, like, man, I had a long day. And your wife's like, I think I hear something downstairs. You have to get up out of bed, go check like it's nothing. Are you sure? Go check one more time. Okay. Right? And it, it, we give lots of examples. But are we saying, where can I lift the hands and spirits of people? Maybe it's at work. Maybe, maybe you know, it, it's, it's covering for someone's shift. Maybe it's doing some of their, they're their, their helping them with work. When you're done, I say, why are you helping me? You just look like you needed some help. What if you bought someone's lunch and just serve people, speak life over people? Serving isn't always just doing things, but it's an opportunity to lift someone's spirit. And I'm the kind of person, as a pastor, I don't want to preach a gospel that isn't something I'm living out outside of the pulpit. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to be like a professional preacher. I want to say, yeah, I'm living life just like everyone else, right? I'm not walking around Walmart like, bless God, lead me to the best deals. <laughs> I don't want to pray for people at an altar one way, but have a struggle praying for people at Starbucks. I don't want to be the person when I'm out in public, it's like, oh, that's terrible, that's going on for you. Well, I'll pray for you. Well, why don't we say, hey, let's pray right now. It doesn't have to be weird. It's only weird if you make it weird. You don't have to scream, in Jesus' name right now, in the middle of this Walmart, let your presence invade this place. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, security, uh, can you come to aisle seven? Uh, we have an unruly customer. He's walking around looking for the best deals, praying out loud, and now he's screaming. <laughs> but you can serve people. I was getting a haircut one time. And, and that's what I'm talking about, because this is, this is for all of us. I was getting a haircut. I was, you know, you have small talk, and all, you know, when you're getting a haircut, and I'm, talk, I'm talking to the, the lady cutting my hair, and she's telling me her story. She's telling me about... Uh, and I'm going to stop here on my story because as we talk about serving people, I want to give you a little how do you serve people on a consistent basis. Listen, if you go to a grocery store all the time or you go to a certain restaurant or whatever, always ask for the same person so you can continue relationship and sp speak life over them. That's a little tip. Anyways, back to the story. So I'm getting a haircut, and she's telling me that her son is really sick. He had... Um, uh, like, I guess, like, a staph infection is blood, and it was, it was really, really bad. And she's really shooken up by it, and she's telling me about it. And then she's telling me about her other son who got in a fight at school, and it, it wasn't his fault, but the school's pretty strict, and they thought they were going to expel him from the school overall, and just they would have to move. And she was just very worried and very anxious about it all. And so I'm listening to her story, and she was just sharing other aspects of her story. And she wasn't having, like, a boo-hoo, woe-is-me type of thing. 
but she was just sharing what was going on in her life, and she was, but she was really concerned about her, her boys. And so I'm sitting there listening, and I really felt God's like, you just need to speak life into her right now. So after I get my hair cut, I said, can I just share something with you? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. I feel like God just wants you to know that he's really proud of you. Like, this is what I really felt in my heart. Like, I didn't have, like, some spiritual word. I didn't have to, I, you know, I wasn't like, your house is blue. And I know as a child, at seven years old, you right, you had this incident at the zoo, right? Am I right? No. I just spoke where I felt God was speaking. And it, listen, and I don't say it's, I'm, it's not about a Nate or T story. It's about when you're just trying to be obedient to what God's doing. So I'm just sharing what I feel God is, has on my heart. And she literally, I see the t- tears just welling up in her eyes. And she starts crying in the middle of this barbershop. And I said, what are your kids' names? I will be praying for them. Fast forward. I then go back to the haircut place, and I ask for the same person. I get into the seat, and I ask her specifically, I was praying for your boys. How are they doing? And she had the biggest smile on her face. She said, my boy doesn't have nothing wrong with his blood. He's completely good, and my son isn't getting expelled from school. I said, praise God. So now, every time I go to get my hair cut, I'm asking her, how are things going with the Lord? I'm speaking life into her. Sometimes we always feel like serving is about making us feel good. But it's amazing. When you begin to serve others, God's beginning to do a thing within your own heart, within your own life. How are we serving others? Matthew chapter 23, verse 11 says, But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. You want to be great? Serve people. Well, I don't want to serve Serving isn't convenient, right? Serving people isn't always convenient. If you, if, if you cook for your family in your house and you have small kids, that is never convenient. I don't like mashed potatoes. You had five pounds of it yesterday. What is the problem? <laughs> this chicken nugget tastes weird. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, knocked the, I knocked the food over. <laughs> Love is patient. Love is kind. I will show my children that I love them. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come. Listen, Jesus didn't come to say, I'm the coming king. Bow down, folks. It's a new era. Jesus came and lowered himself and served people. The Bible tells us in Hebrews in chapter 4, we don't have a high king who's not familiar with our, who's not familiar with our sufferings because he was tempted in every way. So we don't get to tell God, God, it's hard serving people. You know how rude people are? He's like, yeah, I know. I've been betrayed. I've been hurt. I know it's like to be betrayed. Jesus, you don't know the hurt I'm going through. Yeah, I do. I do. Let's show God to others by how we love them and how we serve them consistently, not when it feels convenient. The third thing is we show God to others by how we repeat. God's love is continuous towards us. It never stops. There's not a moment where God's saying, I'm, I can't love you right now. I'm ashamed. I want to be consistent in how I show love to people. How often do we repeat it, right? Do we just say, well, you know, my family needs love all the time? We went to Cedar Point last summer. I mean, that that was a lot of money. Paid $15 for a pretzel. Right? Maybe it's our spouse. Like, they are so needy. Oh, my goodness. Right? You can, you can, you can get in this place. But listen, we have to be in a space of saying, listen, I want the people that are around me to know that I love them and care for them. 
But I am for them. Not because I'm just telling them, because I'm showing them. If the worship team can come in place here. And we're going to head into a time of, of prayer. But I want to challenge you. I know we have kids and teenagers, college age and adults. Sometimes we let our life situations hold us back from how God is asking us to live. We could begin to just get stuck in the past, and that's where the enemy has his strength. The devil cannot stop anything that God has coming to you, but he can try to stop you from getting there. The devil cannot create. He's a manipulator. Right? The Bible says what God has intended for good, the enemy is intended for evil. He can only manipulate. So if the devil can get you a distorted view of what it is to serve people, say, yeah, you can, why serve people? Your, your kid, no one appreciates you. Yeah, you're like, yeah. No one does appreciate me. I do a lot. Come on, let's be honest. You can fall into this place and say, I see how that couple lives their life. I wish my spouse was more like that. Why can't my kids be better behaved? And we begin to envy the things of other people. But God has asked us to steward what has been given to us. So we don't get to just say, well, well I, I, I tried, it just doesn't work. I tried this church thing. I tried loving my spouse. I tried speaking life over my kids. But come on, let's really challenge ourselves this morning. And myself included. Well, when's the last time you prayed over your spouse? We spoke life over them. We looked them in the eye and said, I got to tell you what's in my heart, my affections and feelings towards you. When's the last time you looked at your kids and said, you're a man of God, you're a woman? Because sometimes you'll have to remind yourself when they're doing something crazy, like, oh, they are a man of God, they are a woman of God. If I raise them in your way, Father God, and put the word in their heart, they will not depart from it. Jesus, help me. You know, teens, college age, when's the last time you told your parents, hey, thank you for all you've done for me? And it wasn't in passing moment of heading out the door, but you sat down at a table and looked them in the eye. How well are we repeating these things in our lives and, show, and, and showing them? It's powerful. In John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Then Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. In your families, are you just telling each other about Jesus and what the Word says, or are you showing it? Maybe today is a new day for your family, for how things happen. Maybe tonight you're going to get together and you say, hey, let's read the Word of God together. Maybe if you're a father or a husband, you say, I've been occupying my things with too many. I've been, I've been too consumed with work. I've been too consumed with projects around the house. I've been too consumed with what's on TV. And I need to be consumed with my family, my wife, and my kids. Wives, maybe you feel like there's just so much going on. You feel like you haven't been able to clear your mind. You feel like you're just completing tasks. But maybe God's saying it's time to sit and rest. Come on. That's spiritual. Don't even get me started on that. There's always things to be done. I tell you, you can't outwork God. If you are in God's grip, if you are in God's peace, his word tells us, right, he will keep your mind at perfect peace whose eyes are stayed on him. I don't have peace. Your eyes aren't on him. There's chaos in my family. Keep your eyes on him. My job isn't crazy. Keep your eyes on him. 
What's going on in the economy? Keep your eyes on him. CNN said this, keep your eyes on him. 